Finkel. Okay. Uh, Kevin, you look underwater. Uh, <laughs> so am I blurry? Yeah. You're good for like 30 seconds and then the next 30 seconds, yeah, yeah. Like you're underwater. I like that. It's a little suspense. <laughs> oh man. All right. Uh, I'm recording. Bruno's ready. We're all here. All right. Ready to go. We got 40, 40 people in here right now. <clears throat> all right. Share my screen. All right. Well, welcome everybody to webinar number seven, how to read research with myself, uh, Kevin Carr and Damian Perry. And we have translation offered again tonight with our good friend Bruno here. Um, you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a little translation uh, like world icon that you click and then you can switch from English to Portuguese. Hello to all of our Brazilian friends watching out there. Uh, remember to use the Q&A box only. So also at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A box. That's where you're going to answer or ask all of your questions. And that will be the only place that we look for questions. Don't use the chat box. Don't raise your hand. Don't text or email us. Uh, I'm Brennan. I'm going to be the facilitator and student again tonight, which I was last week, uh, because research is not my forte. And these two gentlemen uh, enjoy research much more than I do. And Damien's going to school to do research, right? Uh, coming fall, biomechanics at UMass Amherst. Uh, so Damien right. will be teaching and leading this webinar. Kevin will be here strictly for emotional support. And also he will be an analyst. So he will call Damien on any BS and commit his two cents whenever he feels like it. Um, yes. Or we will just cut him out of it and he can go hang out at home with his dog and watch Netflix or something. So <laughs> questions. Now, I read a bunch of the questions that people asked uh, when they registered. And I am I did not include any of them in here because they really all fell into four or five categories. So the first main question was, is why should I read studies? Where do I find good studies? How do I know it's a good study? How do I know if it's biased? How do I decipher the statistics? That was actually the number one question we got is how the hell do I read statistics? And then can I just read the abstract? Do I have to read all the other stuff? Can't the abstract just tell me everything I need to know? Uh, and I am under the assumption that Damien is going to answer all of these questions with his lecture slides and Kevin and I will poke holes and ask questions and everyone will get a post email with anything uh, that we told you we would send you you'll get this recording you'll, you'll get a PDF of these slides or Damien's slides real quick uh, I, I put all six of our recorded webinars at on this link at our blog on certified functional strength coach so you can watch all the videos there and you can access all the documents. So you don't need to email me. It is all on one blog post or one article, including the downloads. So you, I don't need to email those to anybody anymore. You can go get them yourself. And I will include this webinar as soon as we're done uh, on that article or that blog post. And I will also send that link out in email. Uh, anything that, I missed, gentlemen, or are we ready to go? Ready to go. You, again, crushing the MC duties, Thank you know? You. Thank you. Thorough, Brendan. Thorough. I'm my best here. <laughs> hey, Damien, you are up, and I stopped sharing my screen, so you're good to go. Remember, everyone, to add your questions in the Q&A box. And actually, because we're not going to be doing any f formal questions at the end, uh, make sure you're asking the questions as we go. I'll be monitoring that 
uh, while Damien goes along here. So use the Q&A box. I'll, I'll hop in to <laughs> what I think I can answer, and, uh, or I can have, we can have Damien answer. Oh, the, the, the underwater Kevin is the best. <laughs> he's been doing so much yard work that he's he's just built a wall around his house. <laughs> the internet doesn't go. I should get a anymore. scuba suit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take it take it away, Damien. Okay, so um this has been called critical appraisal. So I'll get into a little bit of what that means, but um just to acknowledge our limitations. Right. So number one, the three of us are just lowly strength coaches who happen to have gone to massage therapy school on top of that. But that does not make us by any means possible uh, hyper qualified to be teaching you how to read research. So this is very much a an exploration of how we try to take research and interpret it for the use of our purposes of creating models for our clients, creating models for ourselves to work within, to answer client questions in an evidence-based manner. So by no means, and you know, I know it was a question, am I gonna be able to tell you about like ANOVA statistical analyses today? Like I, I just don't have the power to be able to do that. It takes, you know, higher level degrees and years and years of courses to be able to start to even dig through that. But what I hope that we can just get into a discussion about today is going to be at least scraping the top for information so that you can make some educated decisions on what you can do to help your clients. So whether that be you're creating your own training system or you are, you know, just trying to answer a question like we'll talk about a little bit today, um, hopefully that you can take something away from this that is outside of a very deep statistical analysis or being intimidated by a paper. Um, so on the note of papers, there's endless amounts of journals and an unknowingly amount of papers published each year. So I, I think a good place to start with this is going to be you're never going to get out in front of the research. Like there's scientists everywhere, there's dumb grad students like me everywhere, all trying to post papers and, and get science out there into the world. And there's gonna be so many papers being pumped out. And then that comes into question the quality of those papers. Not all of those papers are gonna be something that's entirely novel that you're gonna be able to walk away from with a new understanding of something. It's just gonna be maybe mundane or repetitive sometimes. Maybe they're just trying to disprove something, which might give you some information or it might not help you at all in what you're doing. So just acknowledging the fact that you're never going to be able to read all of the research uh, will lead me into some of the points I'll make later in the slides. But um, I know one of the questions is kind of upfront of like, where do I go look for this stuff? And I mean, peer reviewed research, it's not too hard to just go on Google and, and search for a peer reviewed journal. It's just that most people skip the step of searching for a peer reviewed journal first and then they just ask Google and some gym bro from the middle of the country who decided to write an article about creatine and how it got him jacked is what you make your decisions off of versus and like clinical evidence that is going to be much more objective and realistic about every sort of minute detail. So um, I think that's a good place to start and just knowing that there's going to be a lot of research out there, but just knowing that you're kind of plucking it from the right places, I think is a good place to start. Um, so this model that I just want to start this presentation off with uh, is something that's sort of taken from medicine. So the evidence-based medicine paradigm. So this critical appraisal process um, by a paper from Guyatt in 1992 and evidence-based medicine is much older than that, but this is sort of one of the iterations of it and the beginning of it being very popular, um, is just putting out there that, hey, it's probably not good enough that we just do what we've always done and that we should utilize the knowledge that is being created in this world of evidence from academic research to actually create evidence-based decisions for what we do with our clients, and in this case, their patients. So, what the model that he proposes in one of his, is the paper that he wrote in 92 was just basically saying, hey, 
it's not good enough just to go off of, you know, what your mentor told you and what his mentor told him and what his mentor, because the passing of the buck, the telephone game can sometimes get a little bit out of whack as we, you know, very well know. So he proposed, Hey, like you have to define a problem. So what that problem might be is, you know, say a patient walks in with some sort of issue and you're not exactly sure how to treat that. And in some cases, because of, you know, your ego or whatever that might be, you're just going to say, Hey, this is kind of what I think is right. And I'm just going to, you know, stick my feet in the cement and go for it. Whereas what he's proposing is that we should not conduct business like that. And we should utilize the literature to search for some sort of validity in what the, the outcomes we're looking for or the treatment that we're providing. So whether that treatment is you in the gym writing a program for your clients of 10 sets of 10 Russian volume squat training because some guy on T Nation said that you should do it to grow your legs or, you know, actual like, you know, a creatine question or something like that that we'll talk about. You know, there's going to be a, a spectrum of stuff and you shouldn't just go off of just secondhand knowledge that you should have some sort of education on primary research. Um, so then it's just saying, hey, check out the articles, look at what this external evidence is saying, and then you can hopefully apply that to your patient problem along with your own clinical knowledge. So kind of meshing those two worlds together of academic research with this kind of clinical knowledge that you have taken from your time being an intern and being a coach. So whether you're a newer coach and you're just leveraging your mentor's experience or you're in the game for five, 10 years, like, you know, the three of us are in this chat, we have a bit of, of kind of anecdotal experience to work off of. Um, so I just tried to simplify it into a Venn diagram for the sake of the visual, right? Because it just helps us to see how we can place this model together. So um, in one corner, we're going to have our clients' values and preferences. I think this one's overlooked often because, you know, we think that we have the best model in place or know the right exercise or the right everything. And honestly, if, you know, if a client just comes up and said, hey, I don't want to do this exercise, like, you should be able to just go, all right, cool. We won't do that. That's fine. So your, your clients' values and their preferences are going to factor into what you provide. And then your coaching expertise hopefully is going to meet somewhere in the middle with those values and preferences, right? So you think that these are the best things that your client should be doing and they have a, a set of values and preferences of what they want to be doing. And you're hopefully going to meet somewhere in the middle, maybe a little bit more skewed towards your expertise side than the fact that they just like crank and biceps all for their workouts. But, you know, you, there's a give and take there. And then this new piece that we're hopefully going to reveal a little bit in this presentation is going to be the best evidence, right? So best evidence shouldn't fall under, I Googled if I should take creatine and the first article said yes, so I took it. I mean, it's probably not <laughs> going to be, it's not going to be terrible for you. Like, like for in most cases, you can experiment on yourself or your, but if your client's coming to you and asking you as a question as, as this expert you should have some skin in the game of actual knowledge of what happens with these substances or with this training protocol. So that if somebody calls you out to say, Hey, like, where's your evidence for this treatment, you should have some something to back it up. And I think that's over the long term, it's going to be flawed because the problem with evidence is going to be you can't test everything. You know, it's very tough to test if one of our massage therapy interventions is, you know, researchable and across the board going to work for everybody because somebody's pain tolerance might be different than somebody else's and somebody else's muscle mass is different. than So there's going to be these factors that, that the human experience provides us that it becomes very hard to research and test. Um, and so my, the example that I wanted to provide here for this best evidence is going to be the foam roller, which if you're familiar with our system, we teach it in CFSC, we have our clients do it. If you look at some of the evidence in the research, it points to that foam rolling really isn't that beneficial any more than just like going for a walk or, or riding the bike for five minutes or these sorts of things. And so if you get a little hopped up on the, you know, where's your evidence train and tell your client, no, you can't foam roll anymore because it's not proven in the evidence, but your client says, 
but I like foam rolling. I would like to do it in the beginning of our training session. If you take that away from them, so that's one of their values or preferences, you take that away from them because the evidence doesn't point to the fact that foam rolling is an ideal use of your time. Well, then that's where you have to start making these negotiated decisions of this kind of Venn diagram that not everything is going to be cookie cutter and very easy to dissect. You have to use the evidence from both anecdotal experience as well as literature to kind of put these decisions together. So I already talked about the, I forgot that I layered these in here, guys. Um, <laughs> So just because I found this quote and I'm having an issue because uh, my face is in the way of mm -hmm. my quote, which is a real problem with these webinars. I know. Um, but I'm just going to leave that up there for a moment and let well, everyone read it. it. Yeah, Brendan, could you please read that? Because I can't see half of it. Okay. Evidence-based medicine is not cookbook medicine because it requires a bottom-up approach that integrates the best external evidence with individual cl clinical expertise and patient's choice. It cannot result in a slavish cookbook approach to individual patient care. External clinical evidence can inform, but it can never replace individual clinical expertise. And it is this expertise that decides whether the external evidence applies to the individual patient at all and if so, how it should be integrated into a clinical decision. So I know that's like breaking the laws of making a presentation by putting, you know, two chunky paragraphs up there. <laughs> With lots but of big I, words. I, I, I thought that it really, read. <laughs> I thought that it just really summarized because I know that people are gonna have this for reference. I thought it really summarized a, a very well thought out position on how we can use this clinical evidence to inform our practice of being a coach without letting it overwhelm or take over the fact that our expertise from all of the hours that we log as coaches is probably just as important in our ability to be a good practitioner. So selecting sources, as I said, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. You can hop on Google and you can find a peer reviewed journal, or you can look in a textbook, or you can look on some forum like strengthcoach.com, or you can just, scour Instagram for all of your evidence-based practice. You know, there's going to be information everywhere. And the ideal situation would be that these all tell the same story, right? That they connect, that the peer review journal says something, and then that gets disseminated into textbooks over time. And then people write nonfiction books like Range or whatever it else it would be about that information and then people blog about it and it, it becomes this nice fluid process where the information from the top is very easily sent throughout the system but what it often looks like is this jumble of nonsense in which somebody on social media decides that they have a new theory and they have nothing to back it up and then somebody on youtube makes a video about that and then it goes onto a forum somewhere and then all of a sudden you're telling your clients to stand on a BOSU ball and like, you know, chug C4 and that's going to get them to be jacked. Like there is a problem with the game of telephone because researchers in general are not very personable or very good at taking their knowledge and sending it out in a package that people can understand. And so therefore, anybody can just grab that paper once it's out there. And because they didn't do a very good job of sending out applied knowledge, you can take your cherry picking bias and just apply it to whatever it is that you want it to be applied to. And even though that, that data might not say that, all of these news outlets and forums and blogs and social media, everything just gets really misconstrued over time. So the, the focus I wanted to talk about today is going to be pointing the, sh the kind of flashlight at actually going to the source information, even if you're not going on PubMed and just searching all of your information to be upfront knowledge that you're learning firsthand. But at least if you see a cool article on somebody's blog that you have the ability to go to find the study that they referenced and you can see for yourself if 
your opinions match with theirs or you disagree with theirs. And that's the most important thing about all this is I don't think coaches especially need to just live with their face in a computer reading research all day to make their decisions because the primary thing behind coaching decisions is time spent coaching. Yeah. <laughs> and secondarily, being able to de decipher whether some of this stuff is legit in regards to the research and the information is, is pretty important to have in your back pocket. Um, so searching for studies, uh, I know this is one of the questions um, and kind of like, where do people look? The, uh, the easiest process is gonna be, okay, I'm looking for this peer reviewed research. I wanna find information like Damien saying that is kind of firsthand knowledge. So um, PubMed is kind of across the board, like this is the recognized, place to gather all of this information from all these journals. If you go in there and search for a journal, you're going to see something from the Journal of Strength and Conditioning and JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine, or, you know, they're all going to be compiled in that database. You're going to find all of the new research there. You can do the same with Google Scholar. So Google Scholar tends to be a little bit broader because it includes like some books and some other random stuff just because it's, it casts a little bit of a wider net. There's not as much of a constrained process for entry to be just kind of funneled into Google Scholar. Um, and then lastly, individual journals, right? So, you know, if I, I have my CSCS, I know many of the coaches at the gym do. If you have your CSCS through the NSCA, you end up getting access to the Journal of Strength and Conditioning. They, you know, if you don't read research, they just annoyingly keep sending you monthly <laughs> their journal and you're like, stop sending me this crap. Like, I don't care. I just want to lift weights and, you know, do whatever. But this serves as a good platform of, oh, like I can read what the newest research in the field of strength and conditioning is about in one nice compact kind of journal setting. And you can scour through and look through individual stuff. And that would apply for, you know, whatever, journal of physiology, you know, blah, 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 blah. You can just find individual journals because then that's going to be a conglomeration of everything in regards to a certain topic. Damien, good, uh, real quick, we got a question in regards to what you just talked about. In terms of research, does the content become more valid due to the time of publication? So the more recent the article, the more valuable the information will be, yes or no? Or does it depend on how no, you study No, it? no, definitely. I actually, I think I said that on a slide upcoming. Um, newer doesn't necessarily mean better, right? Because a lot of times people are just replicating studies and continuing them and like retesting hypotheses in different ways. So a lot of times it's, it's very repetitive, but I would say something that stands kind of the test of time and is still kicking around as something that keeps getting cited is probably a little bit more robust and valuable in regards to a study and something that's new is just a new study. There's no, there's no kind of test of whether it is relevant in regards to the information yet because it's it's new so in regards to maybe a meta and then i'm getting ahead of myself here but if you're looking at a new meta analysis which a meta analysis is going to be looking at all of the studies that are available about a certain topic and evaluating them statistically a new meta analysis would probably give you a lot of good information of an update of what's actually happening with a certain subject but a new randomized control trial is not necessarily better than an older one because they are com they're completely objective. It is, this was our, our, our hypothesis. This is how we studied it. This was our results. So older or newer isn't very relevant there. But as I said, if it's something like a review article or something like that, that, that newer sometimes can be better. Cool. Thank you. How am I doing, Kev? You You're with doing, me? Can you? Yeah, I love you the inputs? water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just want to listen to you. I just want to listen to you. All right. <laughs> so I just kind of dropped these in here. It's just it's just like hopping on Google, right? But it just allows you a a little bit more of a filter. So rather than getting articles from the Onion, you're gonna get stuff that's telling you exactly what's going on in the world and you're going to be able to skip some of the satire and skip some of the jabronis that it's just pure opinion you're going to get some science so just a, a little bit of a tidbit here as we start to get a little bit closer to 
actually taken a look at some of these things. If you go, just like if you Google search coffee right now, there's going to be 40 bajillion articles that come up about some people saying that it's good, some people saying that it's bad. It doesn't matter. And then there's just going to be somebody telling you how they make their coffee and whatever else is going on. But if you want to actually start to dig into a specific question, which is what you should be doing when you look at this stuff, just limiting some search terms will go a long way sometimes. So a really just quick thing, and I, I didn't think I needed to say this, but I was talking with one of our other coaches one day and they were like, oh, like, how did you come to those? How did you find those studies? I was like, oh, well, I just limited my, my search terms. And they were like, what do you mean? And I was like, all right, well, let's, I'll, I'll use that in this study, in this kind of talk here. If you just search for creatine supplementation, I got 2,159 results. If you, re if you have time to read 2,159 papers, then you're probably not coaching. I don't know what you're doing, but that's a lot of papers, right? But if I limit the searching parameters to creatine supplementation and strength and adult, because if you guys uh, saw the question from, Brendan, you sent that out, correct? Yeah, I sent three, the three articles out. Yeah, I'll send them again too. No, 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 you don't know. But I'm just saying, it, we're going to go through a question today of an, a, an, like a client asking if you should take creatine. And so if you know the question that you're trying to ask, you can limit your search terms to help funnel these databases to spit you out what you want to get. All right. So then once you start to get, you know, knowledge spit out at you, it's just going to give you, just like if you do a Google search, it's just going to tell you a bunch of stuff, right? It's just going to be like study number one, two, three, four. And as I said, you know, there were 70 something studies, even under a constrained search tool. You have to kind of just be able to scroll through and read and say, what studies are going to be relevant to me? All right. So what journal is it published in? I, I mentioned journals before. You can see under the search terms that Okay, like it was published in the Journal of Sports Medicine. It was published in X, Y, G. It's going to have it listed there for you. And then, um, actually, I it was the next like two slides later. Newer doesn't necessarily mean better. So obviously, you take a look at when it was posted, especially if it's something like a review article, because a newer article is going to have more information that from recent studies, whereas an older one might be missing something. Um, and then, does the title of the study actually encompass what you're looking for. So um, if my research question, as I'll, I'll restate later, uh, a middle-aged male client came to you in the middle of your training session and says, hey, I was reading somewhere on the internet that creatine is going to help me gain strength and gain muscle. So Kevin and Brenda laughed because every male client ever has pretty much asked that question. <laughs> At all ages. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't matter. And so then, I mean, you have a few decisions in that case, right? You can, going back to our evidence-based model, you can say, yeah, I took creatine when I was, you know, 24 and I gained a bunch of weight and muscle mass and blah, 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 blah off of doing that. And that's one way to do it. Or you can be like, yeah, my friend Bill over there in the other side of the gym doing the bicep curls, he takes creatine. It's a good, it, it works for him. So you should do it too. So that gets out of, you know, we're going to try, we're trying through this presentation to throw some of those anecdotes out the window so that we can disseminate a little bit more specific recommendation for our clients. So these are just basic considerations of like our first pass through when we get a list of studies, like what do we want to start to look for? And then this starts to get into probably the meat and potatoes of what folks are going to be interested in learning today because it starts to be a little bit more and on the complex side of going to be this hierarchy of evidence. So I mentioned some things earlier about, you know, randomized control studies and, you know, meta-analysis and review paper and all these sorts of things. So if we see in our, our pyramid here, the top of the pyramid is going to be systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomized control studies. All right. So what that means is uh, these analysis and reviews, they're going to do the work for you. So somebody who's smarter than us in this chat, as I said, we're not full-blown scientists. We're just some strength coaches that try to be smart sometimes. 
but somebody who is a, a full-time researcher is going to take all of the papers available about one subject. So I sent out a meta-analysis meta about creatine to Brendan to send to you, in which those researchers took you know, however many studies they looked at and, and took a full consensus of what's going on with creatine supplementation. And then they analyzed the statistics to tell us, hey, the research tends to lean towards creatine being something that might be valuable. So you get a full picture of the entire kind of internet of research studies. As I said, there's millions of studies out there. They're gonna do some of the work for you. So meta-analyses and systematic reviews are a great place to start if it comes when it comes to trying to start to read some research because what it's gonna allow you to do is read some of the lingo and start to be kind of well acquainted with the jargony stuff that scientists like to use that make it very hard for that for you to read their papers. If you jump right into a control trial with, you know, all sorts of, you know, internal physiology this and like three letter abbreviations for everything and all sorts of cited studies, it gets a little bit hard to read. It's not like reading a, you know, a casual novel. Uh, but these systematic reviews and meta-analyses tend to do a better job of, of kind of creating a narrative. So it gives you like a front to end and it gives you the statistics. So that's sort of the top of our pyramid. Then stuff like randomized control style, bleh, randomized control trials, cohort studies, case control studies. Basically, as we go down this pyramid, our risk of bias, is, did they get higher? Because now we're not incorporating the full body of evidence. We're looking at more lower and lower kind of, sorry, I lost my word there. So think of it at the top of this as being the most amount of people and coming all the way down to the bottom being the least amount of people. So something like a mechanistic study or an editorial or an expert opinion is going to be factoring in like, hey, my client took creatine and it worked better. So creatine's good. And then as you go all the way up, the quality of the evidence is going to go higher because it's in just factoring in more people. Um, so all of this is just to say, I, I found this kind of more recent hierarchy of evidence kind of look, and it's kind of my view on how I think this all should be, is that you need to factor in things like cohort studies and case controls and case series and randomized control studies, all in this kind of wave-like function to just say, hey, I read some papers and I'm trying to get a, a grip on what the evidence is trying to tell me in, a, in kind of smaller studies looked at through the lens of a systematic review or a meta-analysis. So all of this just to say that there's going to be different qualities of evidence and the, the bias that exists is going to be a sliding scale. And you as a reader just need to be able to decipher the quality of the evidence and know what kind of paper am I reading and what do I have to look out for? So is the bias really low because there's so many studies that they're looking at that they can't cheat the results or is the bias gonna be something that might be higher? Uh, so start to go through it kind of one by one here. So a systematic review, like I said, so they're appraising and synthesizing evidence from multiple studies of the same research question. So systematic review is usually just gonna kind of gobble up a meta, a meta analysis or, or multiples of them and kind of just send out a little bit more of like a narrative based bit of information. It's gonna be a little bit less on the study side of thing and a little bit more of like an interpretation of a lot of the evidence to something that might be a little bit more clinically relevant. And then the meta analysis is going to be within those systematic reviews because it's going to be their statistically kind of summarized evidence. They're gonna take all of the research on a particular subject and then they're gonna run it through statistical analyses to say, hey, our evidence of all of these studies leans towards this as a better result or this as you know not being relevant in regards to research. Uh, randomized control trial. So, that's you know up at the top of our pyramid there, just below the systematic uh, kind of review papers. So basically, what we're looking at with these is that they are looking at an intervention right on the spot. So, in randomized control style try to, the trial is more of what we're thinking about when we think of research, right? You're thinking of some scientist somewhere with like a beaker, like mixing things to see you know what is going to work and what's going to happen. 
in regards to coaching and exercise, uh, the RCT is kind of what you're thinking of, of a researcher saying, hey, we want to see what's going to make you sprint faster. So we're going to have this group try this intervention. We're going to have this group try this one. We're going to have this group try this one. And we're going to see what happens to see who ends up faster at the end of it. So this is considered the gold standard because you have to be completely objective. It's one intervention and it's, it's just one set of people that you're dealing with. There's less kind of noise that you have to deal with because you should be constraining your study to have the least amount of variability to kind of mess up as possible. Um, there's no way that this one study though could prove kind of the causality of everything, right? And that's why those meta-analyses exist because it factors in all sorts of studies to, to control the body of research there's always going to be the fact, the human factor in any research study, the fact that, you know, you go into it with a little bit of bias of, I think creatine is good for you. That's, that might show in how you put together your study. So no one study could ever be the end all be all, but it's a, a gold standard as kind of is put out in the world. Um, observational study. So this starts to get a little bit in the murkier water. You notice it's taking up a bigger chunk of that pyramid on the top right there. It's observational because the investigator is not manipulating anything. They're just taking a body of data from somewhere. So whether that is, you know, from out in the world, from different clinical practitioners like doctors, doctors take notes of what's going on with their patients. They, fought, they upload them to different databases. And, and then this researcher sends out a survey and the doctor sends in his data along with all the other doctors. So they're just looking at what's going on in the world they're not creating the experiment. So there's a little less control of what's going on. And the biggest thing that I could think I could probably give people with this is going to be that oftentimes it's retrospective. So they're just looking back at this data. And this is where the bias of a researcher really starts to show up. So the example I can give here is something like um, the topic of eating red meat. Right. So you can look back and say, all right, everybody who eats red meat seems to have higher values of cardiovascular risk. Right. But what you don't often see in those surveys and what you can you can construe from the data is going to be people who eat red meat probably don't exercise as much or probably don't do X, Y or Z. There's this kind of healthy user bias that might be factored in. So uh, with it being retrospective, you're just looking back at one set of data and you can't factor in all of the factors. And so therefore these observational studies, which is kind of the home base of epidemiological research, so looking at diseases, uh, they are often pretty flawed. But what we can do is we can generate hypotheses for randomized controls trials from these epidemiological research papers, right? And I think that's very important. But what often happens is people just take the epidemiological research and then it ends up in the newspaper saying that eating red meat gives you cancer and cardiovascular disease, right? So they just take the narrative from a study, try to summarize it into a sentence without any factors of kind of actual clinical anecdotes or, you know, creating a new study to actually look at the smaller factors. They're just looking at this big painted picture. Um, and it's it just often very flawed. So that is where research in the media, and you know, if you think back to that kind of cobweb that I drew up over there, that's where things get into a very funky game of telephone is that if you're not factoring in what type of study you're looking at, you very well be making some accusations that are not backed by research, even though you took it from a research paper. Uh, anything to add there, boys? I would just say it's, I mean, we, we um, talked about I this just, yesterday um, in our our group chat, Damien, that it's very easy for you to believe something and then find research that supports your belief. Um, so, for example, we were talking about if we thought colleges would be a thing in the next 10 years or what's going to happen to colleges. So I've been finding lots of articles that support my belief that college won't be what it is in the next 10 years or even sooner. Um, but it's very easy to find not just studies though, but 
people, right? People who have uh, a platform, who are famous, who agree with you. And then there, therefore it makes me feel better that I'm confirming my own bias and that somebody else who I deem as smart is agreeing with me. Um, so it's very easy to find things by just Googling, like people who think college will go away. Like I could easily support my own bias. Um, so that would be one thing I would say is uh, be careful of yourself. <laughs> and I'm sure you're going to talk more about that, but yeah, I mean, it's, you it's all, say that. It's really hard to read uh, any sort of research that you take in that is contrary to your belief, right? You'll always, uh, your bias always find you get a way to discount that. But um, just on this last slide, it's just, I remember a professor saying to me early on, um actually you have joe hamill's a guy that you're going to work for right or you're going to work with at umass and uh yep i remember them saying like uh epidemiological studies are there not to draw conclusions but to ask better questions right and that's really what yep. they are right they they help you help you form a hypothesis but like you said a lot of times in the, the example of the red meat study is is perfect is that they get published in an article or in some sort of editorial and then someone runs with that as uh, as a conclusion or as fact, whereas it really just helps you draw a better question up rather than a conclusion. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just like you, you know, we're we're the easy ourselves are the easiest people to fool, and because it's it's hard to check your own bias, and so you know, if you read something like Brendan was talking about about you know he thinks colleges are going to change in ten years, and then he sees a headline that says something even remotely similar to that he's going to go just snack that and just send it out to everybody like he did. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, that's a very, <laughs> I'm right, you know, <laughs> but in that example that it's, you know, no one's going to get hurt over that. Right. It's just like, he might, I will rain might get hurt because you might put your money in the wrong places. But, <laughs> that's not um, funny, but kind of funny, but not funny. But <laughs> Rain's is Brenda's daughter. Um, but the the factor that we have to think about is that it's in that silly example it's just for laughs but if it's you know if it comes down to telling your client to not do something or to do something that could change their health or change their life in some sort of positive or negative way because of some article that says whatever and i mean us as coaches probably we can just get the negative end of it because all of our clients come in and say oh i saw in the news that I shouldn't eat red meat anymore because it's going to give me cancer and cardiovascular disease. And then that's like the flavor of their month or they watch some Netflix documentary that says the same sort of thing. Uh, we need to be able to take the research for what it's worth and actually provide them with very grounded evidence that will keep them on an even keel rather than them living their life in all of this volatility, you know, just keeping a little bit more of a like, Hey, we'll, we'll try that. You know, and we'll see how it goes. I know Kevin's at that. You're just balancing his clients like crazy ideas of just being like, yeah, sure. Like, we'll just do a little of that. Um, but now we're kind of getting into the weeds. So that is some takeaway from observational studies. Just knowing that, just like Kev said, <laughs> there it's a source to ask good questions. You know, it, it's, a, it's data. So on that point, uh, I like this quote from Robert Persig. Uh, it was in one of his books, Lila. Data are data. It's not great grammar there, but data are data. It is the intellectual framework with which one deals with the data that is at fault. So we humans are the broken ones, not the science, right? Because numbers are just going to be spit out of a computer. So unless you manage to mess up your study, those, that num those numbers should tell a story. And it's your job, just like you're kind of carving a statue, to, ch to chip into that data to find the right narrative to help humanity out. So whether that's creatine or cardiovascular disease or whatever that may be. Um, Can I just add something real quick? When, yeah. when you talk about all this stuff, I, I think everyone on this call and that will watch this later uh, needs to understand that we are living, like, current, like we are making these webinars because of COVID, which we've seen over the last seven weeks has right so there was all these drugs that could have been good for you that had not been 
researched yet. There's the, do we, right, the, all the different companies that are trying to get to the vaccine first, but there's all these roadblocks, like you got to test it on mice, then you test it on pigs, then you test yeah. it on people. <laughs> but I think everyone right now can relate to, that might even be more relational right now for everybody on this call than so much strength and conditioning or whatnot. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Everything you're saying, I'm thinking about like that malaria drug that they were just giving people without ever I, seeing any reason. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, why are people why are people doing that? Why are they just taking it at their own accord because they read it in a newspaper or they saw it online in a at a in an editorial without doing the research first. So we are living right now in a very important time for things like knowing how to read or understand research. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It's funny that you said it because that was this was the slide I was going to give that same kind of the, the COVID talk. Sorry. The COVID pep the COVID no, it's perfect because I'd rather have you say it than me. Is these these bias these biases and confounding factors are are something that's especially in a time like right now where everyone is basically in an arms race to be the first person to release the knowledge, right? So whether that be news sources competing to find the study or the scientist that's going to fix all this or whatever that might be is that people are just going to rush through chunks of data and they're going to swing statistical analyses to tell a story because that's how they make money, right? Scientists don't necessarily make a lot of money from saying, ah, that didn't work. Next, right? It's like, <laughs> you know, if they're getting funding from a company, which could be a good thing or a bad thing, right? They're, they're testing some sort of product. That company wants to see that their product works. And so sometimes things get a little problematic if you're being funded by a particular source, right? In the case of all the COVID stuff, it's just like they're trying to find something versus nothing. And so they're just taking all these surveys and very kind of shoddy evidence and trying to put, the, put some pieces together. And the next thing you know, people are injecting bleach into their blood. Like, I mean, as silly as that is, <laughs> it's, it's a, it is a problem that is blown up by media and YouTube and whatever else broadcasting research that they don't know how to read, right? So these, these biases are, they're just kind of tucked within studies. So starting first, absent of, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right, so just because there's no evidence proving something, it, it doesn't mean that it's not there. All right, so it, that could be interpreted a few different ways. Number one, if you see something on a daily basis as a coach that you have found to be very, very spot on, and then you go and look in the literature and it's not backed up, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily wrong. I already mentioned this briefly. It just means that it's probably a very hard thing to test with complete certainty and, and kind of constraints. And so therefore nobody's been able to test it. And so that is one side of it. And the other side of it being is that you're not, you're only seeing what's reported in a study or a very variable amount of studies. You're, you're not seeing what isn't reported. And that can often be a very important thing to evaluate is like, what did these, what did the study not tell me? It told me that creatine increased my muscle mass or can increase my muscle mass, but it didn't tell me that creatine is going to make me bloat up and gain 10 pounds of water weight, right? So it's, you have to look at all of the evidence that you're, you're kind of evaluating and just know what is this telling me, but then also what is it not telling me in this kind of picture that they're painting from the research? Um, the null hypothesis, just as a kind of offshoot of this, Science as a, a method is trying to prove themselves wrong. And so that's where people should just need to evaluate when they're looking at these studies is that they're presenting a null hypothesis. They're trying to prove themselves wrong. They're trying to say, this should not work. And then when they test it, it works. And they go, all right, well, we were, we were wrong. This, this supplement changes our physiology or whatever that may be. All right. So 
if you are approaching the research and you're looking at stuff saying, I need to find a research paper that tells me single leg squats are better than two leg squats. Well, you, you might not find that directly and then you might just cause a bunch of different inferences from different research to try to create this thing. Research at the end of the day is trying to prove itself wrong. So just you being able to acknowledge that is gonna help you decipher stuff a little bit better. Um, in regards to bias, we, we kind of harped on it enough at this point, but scientists are human. They're gonna have their biases too. You can't just take every study at face value. Uh, and those biases are often gonna be embedded deep in kind of st the statistical analyses or in the way that they created their study. So you have to kind of be like a hawk when you're reading through these things. And the attention to detail piece, in regards to knowing the statistics, I'm not gonna be able to tell you how to read the statistics, right? especially today. I can, I can do my low level version of checking out what's going on. And we'll talk briefly about just like maybe what some of those statistics mean, but I'm not gonna be able to tell you what an ANOVA analysis is because it's some computer program that grabs a thousand pieces of data and runs it through a machine uh, and spits out, you know, a p-value or something like that. So the more important thing is going to be if you're well read by reading a lot of textbooks, reading a lot of different papers, reading things from your mentors, that is going to be a good body of evidence to give you a model to work from versus just reading one paper and deciding that that's the new Bible and this is how we have to run with things from now on. Right, the kind of the body of evidence from many different papers and people that are smarter than you that can interpret them in a better way, the conglomeration of those effects are gonna be probably more important than you know what one paper will ever tell you anyways. So I, I just wanted to make a quick example of how we can play with statistics in the most silly sense. Uh, you're going out for a hike and you can choose to cross a river or go a few miles around to a bridge. You are told the river is 100 feet wide with an average of four feet deep with very little current today. And that's Ace Ventura, if you didn't know. <laughs> He's out there swimming with the Crocs. But, you know, you're out for a hike, you get all your gear. It's like, you know, 30 pounds, 40 pounds worth of stuff in a backpack. And you're like, ugh, like I'm tired. I really don't want to walk the extra miles around the bridge. This sign here says it's an average of four feet deep. And then you start walking and you could have either of these situations, right? You could have a hundred feet of four feet deep water, or you could have, have that split into thirds. And then you end up in eight feet water for a third of that in which all your stuff is now soaked. But the sign at the beginning was not wrong. It was not lying to you. They are both an average of four feet deep. So this is the most silly example. And yes, I went and drew on graph paper for you guys this because I did not want to do it on PowerPoint. But um, this is a very silly thing is that statistics can be manipulated in which way you want to tell the story. So in light of all the stuff that we're talking about with COVID right now and everything, people were taking statistics and flipping them one way or another so that they can tell you whether it's safe to go out or it's not safe to go out or you should wear a mask or you should not wear a mask because it's what they believe in. Or maybe not, maybe they're just being discreet with the evidence and it's what they're telling you. But you have to factor in that you, you can't really trust anyone and you have to be able to kind of evaluate the statistics for yourself to some at least low level. So reading research is a lot like reading Shakespeare. I kind of came up with this myself, but if you all go back to high school and, and we factor in, hey, you know, English class, you guys are gonna read Shakespeare. And you pick up that first Shakespeare book and you're like, what the hell is this crap? This is not the English language, right? At the end of the day, it is the English language. You should be able to read it. But just if you've ever picked up a scientific paper, you're like, I don't know what half these words mean. Never mind understand what's going on in this paper. And that's made me think back to high school English where you know, you're know you trying to read a Shakespeare thing and the English teachers is going crazy because she loves Shakespeare. And you're like, I don't even know what these words are. He made up words, you know? How can you read that? So that thou hast forgotten to demand that truly which thou wouldest truly know. It's just like, 
you know, that means, cause I looked it up on spark notes, just like I did in high school, <laughs> you know, like you forgot whatever you forgot that question that you're actually asking, you know, it's just like, it's a bunch of gobbly. I think that's a screenshot from Brendan's. <laughs> from what? You broke up, Kevin. From your book. Oh, my book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coaching, the that's coaching rules. Brendan's that's, book is. That's one of my rules. <laughs> Thou hast forgotten how to deadlift. <laughs> I just thought it was a funny example because that's basically the, the realm that we're walking into with this research, right? Because as coaches, we're not well-versed in what the kind of metabolic aspects of liver function in regards to drinking protein shakes. Like we don't know that. We just know that like drinking protein, they say it helps with gaining muscle mass or drinking creatine supplements is going to help. You don't know the, the kind of very complicated mechanisms going on physiology wise that they're going to be talking about throughout that paper like you know what's going on they're not necessarily writing it for you they're writing those papers to communicate with other scientists and other researchers so that they can create this model and and make new science and find these new discoveries if they have to simplify everything down to textbook level then they're not going to advance science, which is why they write textbooks so that they can simplify those very complicated things into a kind of a grand narrative. So just know when you're trying to read those Shakespeare like articles, you know, about something that it's going to take some work to understand what's going on. But after a few reads and a few kind of spark notes of certain things, you can start to understand what they're saying. Um, and they usually do a good job in the kind of discussion sections and everything kind of talking about that, but as a whole, it gets a little bit bogged down. So was a textbook, a cliff notes version of studies. Yeah. Right. So that's going to be a academic researcher or, you know, a member of a faculty at a school oftentimes that they do their own research in a particular area. And then they decide at a certain point in their career, they're like, well, I'm going to write the book on this stuff. So uh, Kevin brought up Joe Hamill uh, earlier. He's a professor out of UMass. Um, he was the author of the biomechanics book that I referenced last week for our functional anatomy uh, webinar, right? So he wrote the book on biomechanics. And he also taught at the school that you two somehow managed to show up to sometimes. <laughs> it's all relative. Let's, let's... Right? But he's just taking the research and the information and a, as a full body of evidence and he is siphoning it down into a position of basics to take people from one level up to another so if we think about almost that hierarchy of evidence model that pyramid from before above meta analyses and and kind of those sorts of things textbooks are going to live up there somewhere above those but with the problem with textbooks is that they're not going to be able to remain current because once you have written it, mm, yeah. it's there, right? So textbooks can take a snapshot and they can update their editions over time, but it's going to be so much of a longer process versus, you know, doing like something like a review paper where you can review a body of evidence, you know, year to year, right? Um, so some things that exist in papers and i just picked three because there's going to be about a million other ones um but some quick things that we can just talk about you're going to see in you know on the back of a supplement bottle it's going to say double blinded research protocol blah 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 and it's just like some bro writing on a, a piece of marketing saying that to try to convince you that you know they studied their their product right so a blind just means that the researchers and the subjects are going to be blinded as if you put a blindfold over them to what the protocol may be. So a double blind is going to blind the researchers and the subjects. Right? A single blind is just going to blind the, the subjects. They're not going to know what's going on. You're going to double blind them. You're going to blind, you know, you're going to evaluate it from both the level of who the practitioner of the research study is, and then who's doing the research study. A triple blind is just gonna add another level. Now the study 
the people conducting the study don't know what the other people that are conducting the study are doing. So it just adds layers to continue making it a bit more objective and less subjected to any sort of bias or cheating kind of going on within the study. Um, and, a, and a good example of that is going to just be if I'm saying to Kevin and Brendan, hey, you guys are going to try to max out your deadlifts. And then I tell Kevin what Brendan did and which would be 95 pounds. <laughs> Kevin, of, Kevin, of course, is going to just do 100, right? Whereas if we blind them to each other, then they don't know what each other had done. Kevin will do 85. And then if we add another blind to it, if you blind me as the researcher, now I can't see how much weight is on the bar when administering the protocol to them. So I don't know what they're lifting when they're lifting it. They don't know what each other is lifting. They don't know. So we're just blinding, kind of putting a blindfold of their aspects of the study. Secondly, statistical significance. So this starts to get into our numbers game. And this is probably the further I'm going to go with statistical significance because these two probably matter the most in how people relay study information. So statistical significance, uh, it just quantifies the probability of occurrence. So you're going to see a P is less than 0.05 uh, with a lot of studies. So basically just what's that, what that is going to mean is that uh, the, the probability of occurrence and the statistical significance is, is 5%. So that's our marker for significance in most research journals or for most studies. So the higher the value, the higher the p-value, the greater the chance that that effect you're seeing is not real. All right. So basically, they're, they're just crunching the numbers to create this probability value to say if that p-value is less than 0.05, you have a very high chance that this study is realistic, that the numbers that we're creating are not conflated by some sort of variable. Um, and that value is gonna be generated from kind of the different aspects of the study. So um, if you think about what I was talking about with epidemiology before, you know, we have some sort of result from the study about you know, red meat is bad, but if you also, factored in the fact that the people who eat red meat that have higher cardiovascular disease also don't exercise and also eat a lot of trans fat and also do all sorts of other stuff that would influence their likelihood of getting this it's going to it's going to mess with those p-values um, the, the more significant thing is going to be within randomized control studies because it's going to tell you that hey this study was significant um, flipping that p-value to the other side is going to be the confidence interval. So it's basically just the reverse of it, but it sounds much sexier to say we have a, we're 95% confident that this result is, that we're finding is, is real, right? But basically a confidence interval is just basically saying that 95% of experiments exactly like this one will include the true mean, but 5% won't. So that's just saying that if we conduct this study a hundred times, then five of those studies probably won't tell you what we're telling you. Um, but if you think about what goes into a newspaper, if the newspaper says 95% confident that red meat kills people, like then, you know, that people are going to freak out, right? So it's just kind of a flip of the interval. If you're a scientist and you're just reading papers, you know what that means. But people who are not scientists that kind of strip these research uh, kind of lingo and then apply it to just general knowledge, it can sometimes get a little funky. Um, anything to add, Kev, Brendan, as a research onlooker? I've, I've never heard confidence interval, to be honest. I've, I mean, I've heard statistical significance my whole life, but I've never heard the confidence interval, but it's a wonderful way to flip that number to make it sound like something I'd rather hear. <laughs> so, no, I, I never heard of that. Right? Like you have a 5% chance of dying or a 95% chance of living. Right? I, I want the 95% chance of living. But it's the same, it's the same number. So I like that. I, I I never, I've never heard that. 
Yeah, and I mean, it, it's a little bit more, you know, to construe it to just like, oh, 5% chance that this is real versus 95%. It, it's a little bit more in depth with the math than that. But it, it, at the end of the day, it's it that last statement that I have there probably incorporates both of them pretty much as uh, something like a, a P value of less than 0.05 or a 95% confident or confidence interval. Mm -hmm. We're basically saying that if we do this study a hundred times, five times we might get some values that don't say what we're saying right now but 95 times if we replicate it it's going to tell you the same stuff yeah and so if you do not if your paper is some sort of value that is beyond 0.05 the higher and higher that goes the less confident that you could say that those results are not you know are real or not um uh, that 0.05 number is just arbitrary, pretty much. I, I think I mentioned it a bit. So uh, a lot of researchers are trying to make that a little bit more uh, constrained to something like maybe 0.005 so that we're we're actually putting better research out there rather than just aiming for that peep is less than 0.05 value. It's kind of like, you know, every scientist just like holds, you know, make crosses their fingers and hopes that when they're done with their statistical analysis that it shows up that it's 0.05, right? And that's probably not what we should be doing with science. We should just be trying to do good science and prove or disprove. And whatever that study says, it gives us information to go forward. But as I mentioned before, you know, you disproving something doesn't get you published in a paper and it, it doesn't give you much more money or attention. So uh, it's sort of a flaw in the research process. Um, so now coming back to you guys um, and just a couple rules and, and basics anecdotes that I've come up with um, and I would love Kevin and Brendan to kind of give their tidbits along the way as well but my first one is know your question right so if a client has a question for you it's pretty easy to know your question they say hey should I take creatine yes or no and you say hey all right cool I know the question I can go online and I can look for that question but if you're trying to follow some of the things I'm saying here and start reading more papers and start doing more in this research realm, you have to be aware of your bias because you're just going to go start looking just like Brendan did for articles about college. You're just going to go start looking for things that are telling you you want to hear. And there's so much research out there that you'll probably be able to cherry pick and grab at least three or four studies that are going to tell you what you want to hear. And then you make a presentation like I did last week that is just full of cherry picked ideas and nothing is actually good. Uh, just kidding. I'm just kidding. But you never know, right? You never you know. Trust yeah. the, you can't trust the person telling you just like you can't trust some random documentary that's on YouTube. Like I probably wouldn't trust any of those because they can make them sound overwhelmingly legit. Like all, you know, like a conspiracy theory documentary. You're like, wow. They know what they're talking about. They quoted research. They have all this evidence, but it's like they just might have cherry picked a bunch of things. So know your question when you're looking at something and that question will act as a roadmap for you. So even if you don't have a particular client question, go into it saying, I want to learn more about, you know, whether single leg squats are better than bilateral squats versus I want to go prove that back squatting is the best and every other exercise is stupid, right? Because your bias is clearly showing, but it can go the other way too. And, you know, we support single legs, you know, exercises. And so we could go in there with the same sort of bias on the opposite side. And we could both look at the same kind of search of studies and come up with completely different reactions, right? Depending on our bias. So know your question and it will help kind of guide you to, objective answers i'm gonna play devil's advocate for a minute do it because so then if everyone has this bias and anyone can cherry pick who do we choose to believe right Trust so no the, one. actually eugenia so eugenia bradshaw asked a great question she said how do we know as consumers when they do release something like the COVID vaccine that it is actually safe and ready to release? Can they alter the research to read that it is safe and ready? Uh, is, it, is it a 
you have to partly trust, but also partly have a, a, a large consensus. Uh, like, how do we make that decision of who's right, who's wrong, um, and who's cherry picking and who's not? Or is everybody doing it and we just have to make a judgment call? Um, I mean, well, number one, I don't want to talk about COVID anymore. We already had our, we had our COVID. <laughs> I don't, I don't know anything about the COVID stats. I just yeah. like, but it's a good the, question. Yeah, 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 no, I, I totally, I, I, it's a good framework for this framework. entire epidemiology kind of conversation. Um, number one, you, you have to put some trust into certain people, mm -hmm. but as we can see with this entire situation that even people in places of power are being questioned up and down by a lot of different people and a lot of different sources. So that's where you need to, I think, just take the body of evidence. And that's where it's really important to read a lot of different stuff. Because if you read the, you know, a newspaper from the left and a newspaper from the right and something that's kind of central, then you can hopefully maybe formulate an, formulate an opinion that is well-rounded, and then you can make your own opinion from all of those opinions. Right. Whereas if you just look to one source, so if you only look at the research and you completely ignore, you know, what people in the gym are, are saying has worked for 20, 30 years, then I think that's going to be misguided because how can you trust some researcher on a piece of paper that you've never met versus your boss, right? You, for you to question your boss, <laughs> for some random researcher, it starts to get a little bit cloudy. And so I think on my last slide, I, I write trust no one because the only person that you should be able to trust in this is yourself, right? You have to be able to make your opinion based on the body of knowledge that you're able to look at. Um, I know that doesn't necessarily answer anything, especially with a COVID vaccine. So you're but, staying in well, hands. I Go think, ahead, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously, you have to read the things that you've pointed out today. But then also, like, that's why you have peer reviews. And uh, yeah. that's why the value of peer review research is so high. Um, and I think you need to put your trust into some of the governing bodies that, that go ahead and review this research. So, like, that's why you have the FDA. That's why you have... Uh, see in these organizations like that like i'm not uh i understand there's conspiracy theories that's why i think covid's a tough topic to use because there's yeah. people who would tell you there's a conspiracy there but uh but i mean that's why when you're interpreting research you you take heed from some of these governing bodies and you use peer-reviewed research to make your decisions you get um and generally that's a, an effective strategy uh if there's enough data out there yeah, and I mean, I'm gonna we're gonna kind of evaluate that today in the fact that we're gonna look just briefly just to talk about it at something like examine.com just to say, hey, what is creatine telling us? And then we're gonna look at a position paper by the CISSN, CI right? So they're like our governing body. Oh, cat appearance. Hey, Maggie. Uh, they're our governing body, right? Of of looking at this sports nutrition just as the CDC and the World Health Organization in the case of what's going on with global health are our governing body. And then you just slowly, hopefully come down through that game of telephone with levels of evidence and trust in, in those governing bodies. But you should be able to kind of check things for yourself. That's mostly what we're talking about with this entire presentation is just gaining some of the abilities to maybe double check some things that are being told to you. Well, and it, it, it goes back to that slide, the EBC slide, which was evidence-based. Yeah, yeah. What, what's the evidence-based? Evidence-based coaching. So it was evidence -based derived based. from evidence-based medicine. Yeah. yeah, so it comes partly from research, but partly from what you're visually seeing in the gym and partly from what people are telling you. Um, and that's really what it all comes down to. So if you took all of those those different pieces of media that mm -hmm. give you answers like social media and Instagram and the N of one, the like friend over there who said it works all fit into the, maybe the coaching 
aspect, whereas all the articles and textbooks fit into the review journals, and then all the community, or maybe the communication stuff has all the social media. So it's all important. And like you're saying, you have to be able to decipher from all of them what it is that's true and what isn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it I want people to think this. This is more than just reading research articles. There's a lot. There's a lot yeah. of moving parts that go into making a a good decision. Yeah. So, I think that funnels perfectly into kind of what I wanted to talk about next. Of rule number two is is read what matters, right? I I mentioned that there's going to be thousands of studies put out every single day. And if you're struggling to read one paper, don't, don't get stuck on the one paper for the sake of not reading anymore, right? Don't just like try to stare at this really difficult paper or difficult topic and then not read research anymore because you're frustrated with that one paper. And then second tier of this is going to be the order of reading is going to help you figure that out. So my personal preference and everybody is different. I'll, you know, hear Kevin's take on this too. But when I'm trying to decipher some information from a topic, I read the abstract, which is the summary of kind of what's going on with the paper, the introduction, which is just going to tell me what the researchers know about the topic and then what their hypothesis is. And then I go into their discussion, which is them telling about their results. And then that's when I come back to the hard stuff. So the methods and the results, which is that's where your statistics and you have to kind of like check what's happening with that paper to see if it's a good paper. But you can pull a lot of information, even if it's just like a literature review about a topic from the abstract intro and intro and discussion. And that's going to allow you to read through a lot more volumes of information. And when you see a paper that really interests you, you can go to that next level and actually look at the discussion and the methods, but not get stuck doing that with every single paper that comes across your lab. Kev, is your process yeah. very similar? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think it really nicely. So the, the methods and also color your inferences that you make from reading that paper, right? So like like Damien said, it's a bit easy to read the abstract and the results because they're generally better writing. It's better quality writing, so it's more interesting to read. It gets down to the meat of what you're trying to understand. And then you can come come out of like reading the discussion and then say, okay, how much value and stock do I put into what I just heard? And then you maybe you read the methods and you're like, oh, maybe from a practical standpoint, that doesn't make as much sense. Um, or you read the results and you look at the stati statistical significance and you say, oh, that probably doesn't hold as much weight as I thought. But just, again, then it helps you ask a better question. Um, and, and it's easier than sometimes getting bogged down. Like sometimes I've read a paper and you start to read and you're like, I can't even get to the end because you're like, oh, so tired. Uh, and then you get there and you're like, oh, it wasn't, it, it slowed me down. So I, I think that's a really good Yeah, I mean, even outside of just reading papers, I think this probably applies to reading books in general, because I know the three of us are all pretty avid readers. It, if you pick up a book that somebody tells you was good and then you are trying to chug through it, and then it stops you from reading altogether because it's just so thick or not that interesting. I mean, don't get so hell bent on finishing that book or finishing that research paper. Continue reading other things about a similar topic or maybe go find a new topic and come back to that difficult stuff when you've either upped your knowledge game of being able to interpret it or you're just interested in it again. So. Um, I think being wide read in a, not, you know, a variety of subjects and not getting bogged down with one is going to help you develop that model like Brendan was talking about of this is more than, than learning to read one paper. It's about learning to create a model. Um, so in regards to reading those papers is engage with yourself, right? So reading a research paper is not like reading, you know, some R.L. Stein goosebumps book. Like you can't just pick it up and like breeze through it and go, oh, that was like super fun. Like, cool. Like this is a learning process, you know? So being an active reader, 
make that article yours. Um, I think that's a really important kind of phrasing that I read in a book not too long ago called how to read a book, but make, <laughs> make the book yours, make the article yours. Like when you download that PDF, it is still the author's, but when you start writing in the margins and writing in the white space all over the side and highlighting all over the place and writing questions and circling things, you've now made that article yours. You, you have taken ownership because you are now a part of the learning process. And you can go as far as emailing the author and being like, hey, why did you do this? And becoming a part of this learning process. Or you can just write that down in your journal that I, my next point is here of just saying, I wonder why they did that. Or this result is really interesting. I'm gonna look up more studies that are looking into this topic. So be active with this process way beyond just reading through it. Because if you just read through it, you're not gonna remember anything and you're not gonna be able to apply it to your clients or your model as a practitioner. Um, so, you know, just asking questions, do I agree with this? How can I apply this? I, I think it's all very important. Engage with others. So this I think is also very important. Probably the next step from engaging with yourself is when you put some skin in the game and you actually talk about it with other people. So, I mean, take this webinar for instance, or the one last week. The one last week, I had to lay out my entire model of how I evaluate functional anatomy. That forced me to learn a lot about things that I question about myself, right? I had to check myself in a lot of different ways. I had to learn how to simplify some things. I had to learn how to evaluate some other things in a different way. I had to learn how to you know, make a good narrative to discuss it. The same can go with engaging with these research papers is that if you create a little bit of a journal club with the, the coaches that you work with, hey, we're all gonna read this paper this week and let's talk about what we found. Or maybe it's just something like social media. You just put it out into social media, hey, I read this, or you're just engaging with other people that have read certain things. Or the one that I think is probably the more important is writing an article or, or creating something like a presentation or a webinar, because that is gonna force you to really take all of the things that you could pull from a paper or a body of papers and say, hey, how does this apply to me? So engage with the knowledge. Don't just let it kind of dwell in your notebook, never to be looked at again, if you actually want, you know, want it to matter. All right, so meat and potatoes time. We're just gonna talk about some studies and uh, get on from there. So just the anatomy of a paper at the abstract, I've already mentioned pretty much all of these, but uh, the abstract, some of the summary of the article and the topic, you can read through an abstract really quickly, and it is going to just tell you what goes on in the paper. Intro is just going to tell you about the body of knowledge and then their hypothesis. Methods and results, how did they do the study? What is the data? The discussion, they're going to kind of talk in kind of real people language again and, and try to summarize their findings. Acknowledgement, acknowledgements and uh conflicts of interest so they're going to say hey like we got funding from xyz uh it potentially conflicted with our findings in this study because we were funded by the you know creatine research center or whatever it might be um oftentimes if it's from a college or a lot of journals they have no source of funding because it's just from the school and then there's no conflicts of interest they're just trying to do good research so it's gonna vary there. And then your reference list, it's just gonna be a list of the articles cited. So our research question, I proposed it, but I will say it again. A middle-aged male client asked you during a training session if you would think creatine would be a good supplement for him to take. He read somewhere online that it helps you get stronger and put on more muscle mass and wants to know what you think. Um, so, this is a question, as I had mentioned before, I mean, the three of us have probably got hundreds of times at this point uh, amongst different clients and people and family members. Um, so I thought it was a good question that could just easily be kind of factored into this conversation. Um, so. Let me. Pull this up. Um, also tidbit, I, I was gonna put this in uh, the presentation somewhere, but I forgot to. Um, a 
do you guys got my screen there of the article? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, uh, just making um, sure because uh, uh, your point of the article. Yeah, it says take home points. I, yeah, I see your PowerPoint. Yeah, I see your PowerPoint. All right, hold on. Oh, now I just see a big Kevin. I oh, see Brendan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All Good. There we go. Okay, so uh, this is Mendeley desktop. Um, it's the Mac version. You can, you know, PC version, I'm sure it's the same thing. Uh, but this is a awesome tool to basically when you download a PDF, you can add everything in there and it will uh, kind of bring up a, a summary of everything by authors. You can search through different things. Uh, it, it's just a good way to kind of clunk all of your information into one place. So um, I, I'm sure that there's other software out there that does the same thing, but this is just the one that I use. Um, so uh, we had sent you guys a few papers um, and I wanted to start with the position paper from the ISSN, right? So I'm not gonna read this to you guys like story time, but I just wanted to have it here for highlighting the fact that <laughs> this is a very, in-depth narrative about all you could want to know about creatine, right? So I don't want to make this a, a webinar about creatine any more than it already has been, but they are going to give you an abstract of a summary and then give you a background, the role of metabolics, the everything you want to know about creatine, they have done the work for you. And as a governing body of the international uh, Society of Sports Nutrition, they're pretty, they're pretty trustworthy to know that they're not trying to, to dupe you into doing something, you know, that should not be done. So they took a summary of, you know, however many studies they, they read hundreds of studies, right? So 269 total cited studies in there. So it's, it's pretty in depth in regards to what they looked at to give us a very nice summary of what matters with creatine. So you can read through that really quick. And just to say, when that client asks you that question, you can say, all right, well, creatine is an effective ergon or ergogenic aid. Supplements are safe, but have reported number of therapeutic benefits, blah, 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 blah. You can learn about loading parameters. So from one position paper, you're gonna get a lot of information. And why I think this matters is that this position paper is going to be straight from the evidence versus some random jabroni's blog that says if you take creatine, you're going to gain muscle mass, right? So he may have got his information from this paper as well, but you don't know that unless he cites his sources, which often people writing blogs and, and doing other stuff are not always citing their sources. So you can just quickly pull up something like this and get a complete Bible about creatine and probably make a, a full on decision right there about its validity for your client. Right. Um, and then I know Kevin had also brought it up when we were chatting about it before, but something like examine.com is, is another similar source of, of they take a lot of things from the research and they break it down and they, and they will spit out a, a evidence backed decision so that you can make your own kind of, objective decisions about a certain topic. Um, then just to have another example of something that I brought up in this presentation was a meta-analysis. So whereas this summary paper is all just words and they're just telling you about all of the findings from the research, this meta-analysis, oop, stop my share screen, sorry. Too many buttons here, too many buttons green one. I had to, it, the stop share is right in the same position as where the tab was. So, um, so this meta analysis here is going to be a different paper in regards to, they are summarizing all of the data that they found, but rather than just writing up a position paper about the, the summary of that, they are doing the statistical analyses, which this paper and many other meta-analyses were probably referenced in that position paper. 
but they're going to create, this is, is a little bit more direct in regards to being able to look at statistical differences and things like our 95% confidence interval over here, right? So if we just briefly look at our, our table here, out of all of these studies, favors placebo versus favors creatine, we are skewing to the right towards our results favoring the intake of creatine towards the question of does it affect resistance training and gain of lean tissue mass in muscular strength with older adults, right? So I just made a complete blanket statement off of staring at a forest plot for 0.5 seconds. <laughs> and that's probably not how you should approach reading research, but this is sort of a little bit more direct look at what the papers are saying versus that position paper you're entrusting to that governing body to make your decisions for you. So not saying that that's bad, just saying that there is one level deeper into the process that you can go and then they will still provide you with a very in-depth discussion and a very in-depth kind of literature review and all that good stuff. So just saying that there's kind of levels to your interpretation that you can begin to go through. And lastly, we have the randomized control trial that I sent out to you guys as well. So strategic creatine supplementation and resistance training in healthy older adults. So if you remember our question, the title of this study seems to be pretty much in line with that question, right? So we have a middle-aged male, he wants to know if his resistance training will improve by creatine supplementation, All right? So I plucked this study out of there without really knowing whether it's gonna be proving, thing one, proving something one way or another, because it doesn't tell me in the title, it just is in line with what goes on for my question. And then, as I said, we just go through the process of, of reading that study in the same order that I had lined out. So first I read the, the abstract and I'm just gonna say, all right, it's unknown whether creatine before or after resistance training is more effective for aging adults. This study happened to look at aging adults 50 to 71. You read through, that's gonna be your stats stuff. Again, in, in the, the abstract, it's pretty easy to digest. As you get into the paper, it might be harder. Um, and then you're just gonna look, there was an increase over time for lean tissue mass and muscular strength and a decrease in fat mass with a P in the less than 0.05, right? So statistically significant that they gained lean tissue mass and decreased in fat mass. All right, cool. That sounds awesome, but we don't know anything about how they got there. They could have just made that up. It could have been a, a study that had a lot of bias in it. We don't know. Creatine supplementation, independent of the timing of ingestion, increased muscle strength more than a placebo. All right, cool. Again, great information with a lot of stats to back it up, but do I know if the study was good or not? I, I haven't looked at the methods. I don't know. Uh, and their final conclusion, compared with the resistance training alone, creatine supplementation improves, mu improves muscle strength. So the difference between reading this abstract and saying creatine supplementation improves muscle strength and telling your client that they should take it versus reading the position paper and the meta-analyses are very different. It seems to say that they all agree that taking creatine will be helpful but you don't know how they found it in this randomized control tr trial. Whereas you know that a researcher that is deeper in the game of understanding these things on these other papers has dissected and gone through this process already. All right, so I don't think this paper was actually quoted in either of these, but um, just as the kind of lens that you wanna look through with not just cherry picking from an abstract and saying, all right, cool, the researchers found it, we're done. I don't have to read anymore. Um, so then, as I said, the introduction is going to be pretty much a literature review. So they're going to see, if you see all the quotes here from different citations uh, of different years, they're going to do the review of the literature to try to help generate their hypothesis. So they had an idea, something they observed uh, with taking creatine or not taking it or, or something they wanted to test. And then they're going to dig through the research that is available to them that surrounds this topic. All right, so I just highlighted a quick few things. Combination of resistance training and creatine, a nitrogen containing compound found in red meat and seafood has shown promise for improving aging muscle mass and strength. It sounds great. It's quoted from a different bunch of different studies. 
But again, it's their interpretation of other studies. You just got to keep, keep digging down deeper as you go. So um, I'm not going to do story time, as I said, but it, it's just the introduction is going to do their literature review. And then they're going to give you their hypothesis in there. So they hypothesize that post-exercise creatine supplementation would lead to greater gains in muscle mass. It was also hypothesized that creatine supplementation would be more beneficial than placebo, independent of timing. Cool. That's what they're looking for in the study. That is their question. Just as we have our question, they have their question. Um, then in reading the paper, I skip down to the discussion. And then that's where you're seeing, all right, what did they find? After you just read what their hypothesis was, you can see what they found. All right. So first study to directly compare creatine, blah, 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 blah. I wrote a quick note. That's also what's cool about this Mendeley system is that you can like write notes right in there. So if I can ever pull it up, oh, it's one of them long. So it was a novel study. That's just all I wrote there is that first study to directly compare creatine supplementation before and after resistance training with a placebo. So they, they did something that they did not find in the literature prior to this. Cool. We might find a new finding. Results show that post-exercise creatine supplementation increasingly in muscle mass, blah, 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 blah. That's what I already summarized to you in the abstract. Great. They're just going to go into more depth here to look exactly at what they found. And then they're going to give you an in-conclusion section telling you what they found and what their conclusions are. Um, so at that point, you know, and I know Kev agreed that's pretty much the same process. It's like, I read the article abstract, I read the introduction, and now I've got through the discussion section, and this seems pretty juicy. This seems like it's going to inform me about something that I can do to help my clients or to help myself train, or whatever that may be. But as I said, you shouldn't just make inferences from what they tell you because they have their own biases. You have to be able to evaluate it for yourself. And that's where you'd look up into these other sections. So that's where you're going to go to the methods and you're going to see actually what happened. So 64 adults over the age of 50, there was 38 women and 26 males. All right. That's a, it's a pretty good amount of people. You know, maybe if they got more people, the study, the study numbers might change. So that's where those P values matter is that if you study 10 people, it's going to be, harder to find that statistical significance or excuse me scratch that reverse it um it's going to be easier to find statistical significance because there's only 10 people you're looking at but if you study 200 people the the statistics are probably going to be more realistic so that's where those p values come into play and that's where having more subjects matters um so they recruited non-resistance trained adults all right so now we start to read into what this study means a little bit more. They're giving creatine and training to people who don't do resistance training. So they found that creatine helps gain muscle mass. But if you know about what we know about exercise, if you take someone who's never lifted weights before and have them start lifting weights, they could probably not eat for a week and they could still gain a little bit of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So that's a factor that you now have to evaluate about this study is that they're using non-resistance trained adults. Why did they do that? They mentioned it here. Uh, I think somewhere I had it. I thought I had it. It's been shown that aging adults may experience residual benefits after creatine supplementation ceases, blah, 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 blah. So they mentioned it in there. It's like they, they give a reason why, but you have to now question, well, my client trains. So does this apply to him? Um, and then you can look at the procedures. As I mentioned before, double blind. So repeated measures in the study in which they were randomized. So they randomized the study. The, the subjects didn't know what was going on so that they couldn't cheat. That comes into our placebo effect. So they were giving them sugar pills or creatine depending on different sessions before and after. Uh, they lay out the resistance training program. So they gave them three familiarization sessions. Cool. They didn't just have them do something completely novel. They did three sets of 10 of exercises of a leg press, chest press, lat pull down, shoulder press, leg extension, leg curl, tricep extension, bicep curl, calf press, back extension, and abdominal curl. Can't forget the abdominal curl. Um, so that one screams like that's just, they had them do a Nautilus circuit at the YMCA, right? So 
all right, in regards to this study, they've never worked out before. And so therefore, these exercises are going to be some sort of stimulus for them. And so it's probably novel enough and good enough for the study. But I might want to look into other studies that summarize this about trap bar deadlifting and squatting and bench pressing rather than machine-based exercises. So it's just, it's again, it's just information that you factor into your results. And then lastly, their results, that's when you just start to dig into the stats and it can get heavy and I don't want to spend much time on it, but it's, I just highlighted some things super quick. They had some people drop out of the study. So again, that's going to lower their statistical variance and make the study maybe a little bit more weary to look at because the lower those participants go, the easier that it might be to find some stuff that isn't real for you know more people. Um, there was a time main effect of a p-value less than 0.05 for home body lean tissue. So people gained muscle and they found that it was statistically significant. There was a time effect for the group interaction of skeletal muscle mass index, et cetera, et cetera. It just keeps going and, and all of their results pretty much lined up with statistical significance. So to not kind of harp on it altogether. And then the last piece, because I know it's, it's getting pretty dry at this point of looking at this research paper with Damien, um, is going to be, if you look at the, the tables after getting the mass of information that you've gathered, hopefully they make sense to you. And hopefully you can use that as a good tool to just say, all right, cool. In my head, that's what I thought was going to happen. That's, that's what I thought they were saying. And now I can evaluate their information in a table. So we see here in this first table, change in lean tissue mass. So they added kilograms of tissue mass. So this was creatine before, creatine after, and placebo. So they found that taking creatine after workouts, they gained more lean muscle mass than when they took it before or when they didn't take it at all. Pretty quick summary. We see up here their statistical significance over time. That was that P, point, P is less than 0.05 value. Great, cool. Same thing over here for change in the leg press strength. So they gained strength. The placebo gained less strength than the creatine groups. Cool. This lines up as a pretty good study overall. It says a lot of the things that was being said in the ISSN paper. Um, and now I can infer that I think it's better that my, my client takes it after a training session if he wants to take it. So we gained a little bit of extra knowledge. It might have said that in the ISSN paper already, but this is your effort to start to look at research papers and, and be able to dig a little bit further for yourself to make your own opinions. All right, I'm gonna give this back to Brendan or Kevin here and let them give an opinion because that was dry. I know guys, I'm very sorry. No need to apologize. You, <laughs> you, you a great job. A, a, yeah, you did a great job. The, and we appreciate how much work you put into this because Kevin and I have done nothing but drink a couple beers here. Um, <laughs> but that that is a very difficult subject to make interesting, but also do thoroughly. So uh, I want people to ask a few questions in the Q&A box while I share kind of what I learned. And I wish, I wish this was how they started our college classes, Kevin, is teaching us this type of stuff because they just throw articles at you. They don't teach you how to read the articles. Um, biggest things I got from it was no, that never. I love the, um, the evidence-based coaching model, the three. Uh, I'll pull that up. The yeah. diagram. So that yeah. there's multiple factors and then the analogy of foam rolling that. So if you look at the literature, some things say that foam rolling is good. Some things that foam say foam rolling is a waste of time. But from my coaching expertise and from what my clients tell me, everyone seems to feel better when they do it. And not just one person and not just like Brendan feels better when he does it. A lot of people feel better when they do it. Um, it's the same thing with massage therapy. It was us all being massage therapists. There's not a lot of studies out there that say massage is doing what people think it's doing but everyone gets a massage and feels better afterwards. So yep. does that mean I should stop doing it because the science says to, that it doesn't do what I think it does? 
Um, so that this was probably my favorite part of the whole presentation personally, that it's not just only they're, they're not, they don't exist in silos. Uh, they all work together. Uh, I never knew anything about the search parameters. Um, cause I'm the, I was the person that would go in and just type in creatine, uh, and find <laughs> articles. I never knew that. Um, the confidence interval, even though I skewed it to say what I wanted it to say, cause I'm biased. Uh, I do see how I do see how media outlets and stuff though can take that number and use it in a way that says what they want it to say. So the confidence interval is something I had never heard of before. Um, and then I really liked the make the article yours and be an active reader. I kind of do that with the books that I read and stuff, but it's even more uh, important I think when you're reading stuff like research that you are writing down your own thoughts, your ideas, journaling, um, because it, like you said, so one of my favorite kind of people to read about or uh, biographies was Leonardo da Vinci's and everything they say or everything I've ever watched or read about Leonardo da Vinci is that he was just constantly journaling about questions and then trying to answer his own questions and then everything that he would read or do he would ask more questions about it. Um, and I think, and Kevin, you brought that up in the beginning that really a lot of this research just allows you to ask better questions in the end. So um, those are my takeaways from today because as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm not much of a uh, researcher. I, I'm the type of person that reads the textbook. And then if there's a study that's referenced, I'll go read the study if the textbook told me to, but I don't go out of my own way personally to find research. It's just that's not me, but if something comes across my desk or there's a textbook, uh, I will go do that. Um, and I was waiting or hoping that if I talked enough, people would ask questions in the Q&A box and no one has. We still have 54 people on here. Um, uh, do you have any final words? I, I guess, yeah, I guess like the big thing is this applies to us as people who are real practitioners. It's like people who are working in it every day fielding questions from clients um use this type of knowledge to empower you right like when you see a news blurb or an article in the new york times that says you know whatever about strength training or about red meat or about any sort of health related topic go scroll down and the sources right that's where most people don't take that extra step um, and then like our job is to be a filter and to decipher a lot of this information for our clients, right? How often they, do your clients come and say, hey, I read this in this magazine or I saw this on the news. Take that extra step, look for the sources, and now you have an understanding on how to vet those sources and come back to them and say, hey, yeah, that's a really good article, actually. I thought it was pretty thorough. Or hey, uh, when I actually looked at the research, uh, these are the considerations we should we, you know, think about because of the paper, right? And being able to decipher those stuff and be a, a filter. Like I would say, like, there's so much media now in the, the hardest thing is being able to filter the information out and decide what's good and what's bad um, and what's in between. So uh, as us, as people who are practical and in real working with people day to day, think of this as just sharpening your filter a little bit. And I'll add to that that if you and everyone on this call, if you want to make yourself more valuable to your people, to the industry, where we are at now in the information age, there's so much information that people are getting paid huge amounts of money to be filters and to be a good filter because now search engines don't really filter they just give you more information. So the reason why there's still 53 people on a two hour call about how to read research is because Damien has done such an amazing job filtering the information. Uh, and that's what people would say about the CFSC. The CFSC is nothing new. It is not a new idea. We didn't invent anything. All we've done is we have filtered the information in a way that is more consumable and people are willing to pay for it. And it's the same thing with your clients. Your clients don't come to you to train with you because they, they can't find the information on training. It's all out there. It's 
it's you just type in Google and you can find tons of training stuff. They come to you because you are a filter that they're willing to pay for. Um, so I think the key word that I've heard both of you say is filter. Think of yourself as a very, like you said, sharpen the filter. You are a very important filter. And the more important of a filter you are, the more money you can make and the longer you'll last in this industry and stuff like reading research is what makes you a great filter. Yeah. And I mean, while I know we got some questions, but like at the end of the day, like I think textbooks are probably more valuable to 90 to 95% of coaches in the industry because you don't need the most novel new information that is coming out right now. You need to have a consensus about what the field is telling you about a certain topic or a certain subject. So reading, you know, Hamill's textbook about biomechanics and reading something about motor control and then just reading something like range that has a cool perspective on the application of statistics and, and people in performance. You being well-rounded in your reading is going to help filter and funnel you to continue to learn more. As I was saying about don't get stuck on one paper, the more you read, the more you're going to be able to discuss new things with your clients or something that you read in the book with your clients that will be able to filter to them, as Brendan's saying. Uh, sort of the, the thing that I've heard said the quote is, you know, walking out to the ocean, it only gets deeper. That, that's basically what happens with information is as you read more and as you look at more stuff, you're only going to continue to find more questions that are exciting to you. And you're just going to keep going further and further out and you're going to keep learning more. Whereas if you don't take the steps, you, you won't get there. Mm -hmm. Eugenia brought up a good point of uh, keeping your own records or keeping a journal is essentially, uh, or past experiences is one of those things that you can do as part of your evidence-based coaching. Yep. Um, and I think the big thing the three of us have all done is uh, we keep our programs. We have all, I mean, I still have every course I've ever taken. I still have all that information that I can reference. Uh, and then I've, I, my, I mean, from God, 14 to 22, I journaled every single our, uh, workout that we did, everything that I've read. Kevin, you were there. Um, uh, there yeah, was I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, there's a question about CFSC and how do we think about changing the evidence or changing the application method? I mean, I haven't written the same regression progression uh, sheet more than one. I mean, every three months I have to write a new one because Mike either changes his mind or we take a course and we learn something new or PRI comes in and teaches us breathing stuff that we didn't use before. Um, so we're just, we're always curating our product as well. Uh, based off of the things that we're learning or people who come in and teach us something new or we we get a new piece of equipment that works better than something else could also be a reason why we change something. Um, so there's just so many different factors more than just reading research necessarily, but reading research is a small part of that that could change our minds or somebody comes in with new research, like PRI is a perfect example. They had research I don't think any of us had ever heard before. Um, and they completely changed our minds on breathing. Um, and it, you can go down that, like you said, you can go down that rabbit hole. You can walk out into that ocean and you might not come back uh, because it's really, really deep. And some people want to go there, but we extract as much of that as we can and then sprinkle it into the stuff that we are do, which we call the, the CFSC or Certified Functional Strength Coach. Um, it's a, it's a matter of, of like having strong convictions, but holding them pretty loosely, Like you need to be willing to, to change your mind pretty fast. So you have to develop your opinions and form your model and put everything together and, and create these strong convictions because nobody will want to listen to you if you, if you're just out there going, yeah, we kind of think this works, right? Like you have to believe in what it is that you've chosen to do, <laughs> but, uh, you have to be willing to change your mind as Mike has modeled for the three of us that it's okay to change your mind and, and admit that you're wrong in the name of doing better by the people that are 
working for you or are your clients or anything like that? Yeah. Last question. Someone asks, how do I quickly discover the quality of an article if it's reliable or written by great researchers? Is it even possible to quickly discover a quality of a qual the quality of an article? I don't know. Um, I, I think I, I had looked at the question. You said in regards to like the pyramid. Um, so that hierarchy of evidence, right? So all that is trying to tell you is that the stuff at the top is going to be less biased because there's more data in regards to those uh, systematic reviews and those multi, uh, the analyses. It's going to say, hey, we, we looked at 300 articles about this topic and we took all of the data from those 300 articles and this is what they have all collectively found. So you can pretty quickly know that that those are going to be legit in regards to evidence with with not much bias able to happen because of the statistical analyses that they are putting those all of those studies through. Whereas exactly what I just did with going quickly through that creatine paper, like that is often what my first read on a paper is, right? Is I just I want to get the nuts and bolts of why are we here what are they talking about what are they what is their question and then how did they how did they get there and what did they find with this study but that's that's the first read like almost every study i actually want to learn something from comes in the second time reading it because the second time reading it i have the full picture and then i can go back through it and go all right, yeah, this is confirming what I what I was thinking from that first one. And then like Eugenia said, and like I had put in the presentation, it's like, you have your notebook there and you had asked all these questions that you came up with as you're reading it. And then your second time reading it, you go, oh, they did answer that. Oh, like they did say that here, I just missed it the first time. And so you can legitimate, legitimize if you think it's a good paper or not. There's no way from you reading the one paper to ever know if it's going to be enough of evidence for you. I don't think one paper will ever be enough evidence to, to come out and say anything in regards to like a hard statement. It's going to come back to that body of evidence idea of you have to go read some other papers that look at similar things. So look at the papers that that study cited and see what those papers said. And then look at the papers that the position paper or the meta-analysis cited and look through those titles and say, oh, are these similar looking than the one I just read? And you can see if they find similar things. Um, there's no way to ever know for sure. Like, yeah. you know, you just got to keep reading. My, I can't remember who it was. I want to say it was Dan John uh, at a seminar said that in any book that you're reading, if you like the book and you think the book is really good or the textbook or whatever it is, and if that book recommends reading another book and you think that book is good, read that book. So I would say it's the same thing with studies. If they make a point and you're like, what, that, that's, it's like an aha moment, like, oh my God, like that's incredible. And then they cite the study or the studies, go read the study or the studies and then make the choice for yourself. Like, oh, that was an aha moment. Or oh, I think they just cherry picked this based off of what yeah. they wanted it to say. Um, so they, that's one of the best things I've gotten from reading books or reading textbooks. Like I said, I'm not a big, I don't go and find research type person, but I will go read it if another book cites it and I think it's interesting and I want to learn more to see if it was something that they actually researched or if they just cherry picked it. Well, I think uh, you brought up PRI and I think it's a good example of people who are critical of PRI in, say that they have no research about PRI. Right, right. If you take a course, there is research sightings everywhere, mm -hmm. but they are, information that the people at PRI have gathered to create their model. Right. So you going to that PRI course and you getting wowed by how charismatic the presenter is and how fancy the booklet is and the pelvis model that they have up in the front of the room, that's all very convincing, but 
people that are critical of their model say there's no actual research to say that their method works. They just inferred all of their information from studies. Right. And so those studies could have been cherry picked to tell the story that they want to tell, or they could be very objective. I happen to, I, you know, I took their course and then went back and was like, oh, I'm going to look at some of these papers that they came to their ideas from. And then you talk to other people that have also taken the course and you go, hey, did you check on that? Like, what do you think? Like, that's where this model of learning comes into play. And that one paper will never tell you anything. Okay. Or one course besides certified functional strength core, core bleh, CFSC will ever tell you anything. Right. We'll tell you everything. We're the best. But um, <laughs> uh, taking one course or reading one book or reading one paper, you're never going to know everything that there is to know. You, ha you have to look full circle. Yeah. We'll end it there. Kevin, you want to say anything underwater there? Just the thumbs up. <laughs> All right. Well, Dan, you know, we're we closing in about two hours. We appreciate your hard work because Kevin and I didn't do anything. So other than sit here. Pleasure. And so I appreciate that. Pleasure. We'll get your slides and send them out to everybody. I uh, hope everyone's well and enjoy the rest of your week. Later. Stay Thank good. you guys. Good work. Thank you. Bruna. See you, Bruno.